So uh, here we go with tonight's confession, which comes from Geography Jeff. Uh, all right, now we had to, we worked very hard making this <laughs> acceptable for family listening. Oh. Uh, Geography Jeff says, Father Simon, Sister Susie, and Brother Matt. Uh, this is another confession from the noble profession of teaching. I say noble, but having listened to your confessions, I can't help but notice that a disproportionate proportion of wrongdoing seem to stem from teachers. <laughs> As a teacher for perhaps too many years in a London comprehensive, I'd like to think that during school hours, I have a good nose for extraordinary excuses, lamentable lies, dodgy dealings, and covert canoodling. But the mysterious thing is that as soon as I leave school each day, the teacher radar switches off, and I join the ranks of the innocent and naive. Let me take you back to a warm summer afternoon as I trundled home after another day waxing lyrical about Oxbow Lakes, Terminal Moraine, and Dem Demographic transition model, classic geography. Classic. We're already in <laughs> <Yeah>. there. <laughs> As usual, I walked a mile or so home through a local park. Now, said park is situated on a steep hill, levelling off towards the top, where you'll often find games of football of the jumpers for goalposts mm -hmm. ilk. To one side of the plateau, here you can tell Jeff is the geographer, the ground <laughs> sloped down to a gurgling stream. Not so much gurgling, more of an almost stagnant slurry of polluted water with the odd shopping trolley thrown in for good measure. Anyway, fairly often I would pass a group of boys from the school playing football at the top of the hill. Not being much of a footballer myself and usually weighed down by a bag of heavy marking it was no coincidence that the ball often was miskicked my way only to be followed oi sir give us the ball take a shot sir <laughs> i was always disappointed uh, with, they were always disappointed with a tame side-footed pass to the nearest player on the afternoon in question i was walking up the steep path that ran around the perimeter of the park when i noticed a couple walking down the hill towards me lovingly wrapped in each other's arms as I approached the lovebirds, they took over the full width of the path and it dawned on me that they were deliberately blocking me and both had mischievous smiles on their faces. Excuse me, says the gentleman, do you have a minute? He held out his phone. Would you take a photograph of us? Perhaps there was an accompanying wink, but he may have been just squinting at the sun. Um, all right, I said. What can go wrong? This is just an innocent couple seeking to capture their undying love in digital permanency. Still with my brain several vital seconds behind actual events, I turned to face them, having somehow found his phone in my hand, held aloft to take a photo. No problem, I thought. One quick photo, I'll be on my way. Click, it was done. Two lovers posing at the camera. There you go, I said, holding out the phone for them to take back. But no hand extended towards me. No, we'd like a few more, please, said the lady. We'd like to kiss while you photograph oh, us. No. Oh, oh, okay, I said in a slightly quivering voice. I was now beginning to suspect something was a little odd. <laughs> but in typically British fashion, I didn't want to seem rude, so I complied with their request. It was just then that the lady... <laughs> oh, no. No, 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 no. ...seemed no. to realise what a hot day it was. Oh, dear. <laughs> And that making the decision to wear a long Mac had clearly been an error of judgment. So, in an apparent effort to cool down, <laughs> she began unbuttoning her coat to reveal her work clothes. When I say work clothes, it was now apparent that she'd come straight from her job as a domestic servant or maid, and a rather poorly paid one at that because her uniform was ill-fitting. But another couple of photos and I'd be on my way. Click, click, once again I went to pass the phone back. Yeah. Uh, not quite yet, said the gentleman. Oh, no. A sense of dread crept over me. Would you mind filming us, said the gentleman, no. with a glint in his eye. <laughs> Somewhat belatedly, my teacher... Took a lot out there. Somewhat belatedly, my teacher radar kicked in, and my inner voice screaming, This is suspicious. Get out before your career ends on the front page of the local paper. I swiftly declined with a firm and overly polite, I don't think so, thank you very much. No. But as I was about to pass the phone back, something hit the back of my leg. I turned to see a football. Oi, sir, kick the ball back. I was now in quite a compromising position. <laughs> <laughs> Facing the group of boys with expectant faces waiting for my feeble attempt to kick the ball back, I was desperately trying to shield their view from the couple <laughs> in their working clothes behind me. Terrified that they might assume I was participating in the sort of movie which certainly wouldn't be no. shown at the end of term. No. So I did the one thing I could think of. I picked up the ball, drop kicked it with all my adrenaline, adrenaline fueled might. It sailed over their heads with their eyes drawn skyward following the arc of the ball. I hurriedly gave back the phone and took off as fast as my walking legs could carry to the size of, Oi, sir, what's your problem? from the football boys. And. Here, mister, don't be like that, from the now slightly frustrated gentleman and his amorous, if ill-dressed, companion. So, anyway, 
I need to ask for forgiveness, not from the couple in question, for not getting a much-wanted video to watch in years <laughs> to come. Frankly, they should have been at home. Uh, and also not from the boys. They clearly... Oh, yes, sir, they enjoyed all of that stuff. But from the one boy in particular who found himself having to paddle in a polluted stream to retrieve the ball Aww. because my mighty cake had sent the ball over the boys and down the hill into the septic stream below. Mm. As a footnote... I am now a head teacher, and I drive to school simply to avoid similar situations. On the odd occasion we are called to sort out an after-school fight in the park, I pass the site, and the incident and the horror comes flooding back. Perhaps your forgiveness will rid me of this haunting memory, and I can once again walk through the park without fear. <laughs> well, no. I mean, I'm used, I'm used to a lot of these confessions, and this one took a sort of a slightly surprising turn. I wasn't really quite sure where it was heading. Anyway, with a swift edit, I think we got there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Geography Jeff, the teacher, would like your forgiveness. Sister Susie from the pub. Well, Geography Jeff, what, what an afternoon, hey? What a walk from home. Um, I, I feel like you didn't really do that much wrong. Um, I feel like you, you, your radar needs a little work. It's a bit rusty. You should probably, uh, it should probably go a little bit before you get yourselves a bit too farther in the situation. Um, but also, you've got to think of the, the little boy who went into the stream, didn't have to go into the stream to get the ball. So you could just bought him a new one. <laughs> Buy him a new ball? Buy him a new ball? Hang on. on. <laughs> anyway, so what are you saying? Oh, but I am going to forgive you. You are going to forgive. Okay. Uh, okay, Brother Matthew. Uh, certainly my walk back through the park tonight after the show has taken <laughs> on a certain edge. Um, <laughs> I I think, this, I mean, what exactly did they, what was their plan? Well, well, don't, what don't, we're going to do, dear, ask. is we're going to go to the park and, and just hopefully run into someone who's prepared to uh, take the photos. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to forgive, um, but, but mainly because one of the most stressful things I find when I'm going in a park and going past people playing football is that the ball will come anywhere near me and in my work boots I will then sky it or <laughs> shank it into a stream or it'll go somewhere no nowhere near them. So definitely forgiven because we could all all imagine where that one was. Simon in the practitioners of purgatory. Have we had that before? <laughs> no, we haven't. That's very good. Yeah. Back in the summer of 1979, I was a gangly 13-year-old at that awkward age of not being sure about anything. To my confusion, the charts were dominated by punk with its associated aggression, alongside the camp frenzy of disco music. I didn't admit it, but I love both, and without the funds to purchase singles from Woolworths, 69p after all, I took to recording the top 40 every Sunday mm, evening. That is killing music. <laughs> Except it didn't. <laughs> Each Sunday, I mean, we've all, absolutely everyone's done this. Right. Each Sunday I would be poised like a coiled spring, ready to press stop on my sister's tape recorder at the merest suggestion that Simon Bates was about to start talking over the end of a song. This was a somewhat haphazard affair, resulting in my recordings either abruptly ending after less than two minutes or being ruined by Mr Bates wittering on about Anita Ward going down <laughs> one place since last week. <laughs> or if... If you need a reminder for younger listeners... Good evening, this is the Top 40 as compiled for the BBC by the British Market Research Bureau. There you go, there's, uh, there's the aforementioned Simon wow. Bates doing the chart. Anyway, says Neil, there had to be a better way. I mentioned the problem to my grandfather, who proceeded to show me the wonders of editing recording tape, armed with nothing more than a razor blade and some sellotape. Once perfected, I tried with mixed success to do the same using cassette tape. The problem, of course, was that cassette tape was very thin and the tape head was hidden under a cover, both of which made editing them much more difficult. Still, after a while, I got quite good and my top 40 compilation tapes were in high demand at school, I'll have you know. And talking about school, this brings me to the unfortunate teacher who is the subject to my confession, Colonel Blunt. Now, there are a couple of things you need to know about the Colonel. Firstly, he was as deaf as a post in one ear, which meant he struggled to locate a sound accurately. And secondly, he had absolutely no classroom management skills <laughs> at all during his English lessons. Luckily, the highlight of English this particular summer came in the form of a regular auditory interruption towards the end of the lesson. Each English, le English lesson at about half past two, a Mr Whippy cream van ice cream van chose to pull into Sunnyside Road, the street next to our school. For weeks, almost every day, the sound of green sleeves would drift into the classroom, interrupting the Colonel's lesson. He's just getting into some Macbeth, and there we go. Oh. 
Oh, yeah, so. OK, so that's going on. So this was the cue for him to throw his book down and start screaming at the nearest <laughs> open window. His face went from red to purple, and looking back, it's astonishing he didn't actually have a heart attack. Such was the stress the ice cream van induced. In fact, it seemed to me that his reaction was becoming more extreme each day, and this got me thinking. So that evening, whilst at home playing my Top 40 compilation, I heard a Mr Whippy van turn into our street. So armed with 10p for a mini milk, I raced out of the house and flagged him down. As a pain customer, I then felt within my rights to ask for Mr Whippy's help. Hello there, I squeaked. Oh, hello there. <laughs> I'm in a school play. We need the sound effect of an ice cream van. Can you play green sleeves for me and I can record it on my sister's cassette recorder? Wow. Well, Mr Happy was most willing to oblige. Mr Whippy was most happy yes. to oblige. Yeah. Mm. There you go. And when I got home, I went to work and started splicing an old C60. I, I've done this. I've done this. Splicing an old C60 cassette tape with brief excerpts of green sleeves at random intervals. A few hours of hard editing later, I now had three full minutes of green sleeves at varying sound levels, but three minutes nonetheless. Thursday afternoon arrived, and just as Colonel Blunt was seen entering the building, I snuck into his classroom and placed the cassette recorder under the inkwell of one of the ancient desks near the window. Inkwell. Inkwell, how about that, eh? Now the Colonel seemed a little surprised by how quietly we lined up for class that day, and his lesson got off to a flying start for a change. About five minutes in, however, the lesson was interrupted by the arrival... <laughs> Get this right. ..of Mr Whippy. My recording of Mr Whippy. The combined effect of having the volume on full, the recording being very loud in the first place, and the amplifying effect of the cassette recorder being inside a large empty Victorian desk meant that it sounded like the ice cream van was actually in the room. The colonel went crimson. The best start to a lesson he'd had in years and it was being ruined by someone selling ice cream. He rushed to the window to see if he could identify the offending vehicle. Failing to see anything, he darted to one of the other windows just as the music stopped. The class exchanged nervous giggles and I felt the heat of many eyes on me. Uh, I asked, would you like me to read, sir? His colour slowly returned to normal and somewhat disarmed, he said yes and I stuttered my way through a passage from Macbeth. It seemed like a lifetime until I got a break when Mr Whippy suddenly started <laughs> up again. The colonel nearly exploded and launched himself across the room as the five-second burst of green sleeves ended as abruptly as it started. What does he think he's doing? <laughs> Screamed the colonel. Where is he? I'm going to report him to the police. The poor colonel was now flagging. He'd not leapt about so much for 50 years. And over the next 30 minutes or so, he had to keep sitting down in the all too brief interludes between aggressive ice cream marketing. At one point, it seemed like the game was up when Simon Bates briefly joined us. <laughs> to proclaim that Blondie were up to number seven. I guess my splicing skills weren't so great after all. But then, with just two minutes of the lesson remaining, things suddenly took an interesting turn as the real ice cream van turned up on the street outside. Loud and proud, green sleeves rang out again for all to hear. The colonel wearily got up to see if he could see the van. I can see him! He screams, and for the first time that day he saw a flash of the pink and white van as it drove past the trees. He bolted for the classroom door, and a few seconds later we heard the outside door slam after him. At this point the bell went, signalling the end of the lesson. With no one to dismiss us, and keen to watch the unfolding events, I joined the rest of the class outside, just in time to see the colonel, beyond the school gates, Dragging the hapless ice cream man out of his van what? by his throat. What? <laughs> no. So, dear Father Simon, I need forgiveness. Please, not from the Colonel. He should have been sacked years before for being utterly incompetent. <laughs> Neither do I ask forgiveness from the ice cream man. After all, who in their right mind drives an ice cream van outside a school at half past two on a weekday? I do, however, seek the forgiveness of the residents of Sunnyside Road, who in the summer of 1979 were no longer able to purchase a cornet or a bright pink funny feet. We <laughs> never, another topical reference. We yeah. never saw the ice cream van again that summer. I, you should also apologise to Simon Bates, really, for editing him inappropriately. Uh, anyway, uh, what do you make of that, Sister Bobby, please? Well, I'm torn on this, because uh, it's very enterprising, uh, editing your TDKs. Obviously, other cassettes are available, because I never did that. I never even thought of that. So that I love, that kind of passing down of skills from granddad Editing to, cassettes was you know, a skill. That is fantastic. However, teasing teachers, I have mixed feelings, because he wasn't a teacher that could take it. There's the problem. Well, See? he wasn't a teacher who could teach, more well, to the point. Well, yeah, it's difficult. 
because it was so much disruption. So, and I felt really sorry for him because what you did is wound him up so much and he was so frustrated. All he's trying to do is teach him Macbeth. And there you go. You just, I think you just took it a step too far. Subtle, gentle, and that would have been enough. I think you're not forgiven, Neil. Uh, OK, so that's one down. What do you say, Brother Matthew? Oh, yeah, that was a classic confession, I think. Uh, the production involved in that, uh, clearly, uh, well over the mark. Well done. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to st- stand up for Colonel Blunt here. Uh, because I mean, obviously, uh, teaching was probably not his calling, let's be honest. That's true. Uh, probably not his thing. What on earth is an ice cream van doing trying to sell ice cream when the kids are all still in school? Why is the ice cream man not worked out? <laughs> No-one's buying your ice creams... Because they're all still in school. It's entirely Ice Cream Man's fault, although probably didn't didn't deserve how it turned out with Colonel Blunt dragging him out through his window. Yeah, that um, was... So I'm going to say forgiven, because, you know, it was the Ice Cream Man well, it was, it was playing his green sleeves. Uh, the, the, the kids aren't even out! Uh, so that's why. Uh, to the eclectic ecclesiastic, says Bill, my confession dates back to a Christmas Eve way back in the heady 1990s. After getting an early start from work, I headed straight down to the local, the local hostelry, you understand, to meet up with the usual suspects for a few jars before heading home. I was still living at home with my mum, my dad, my brother and sisters at the time. Using an athletics metaphor, in this Olympic year and all, what was meant to be a Usain Bolt type sprint turned out to be a Mo Farah 1500 metres as pint after pint was consumed. In the meantime, my brother had also finished work and joined me in the merriment, managing to catch up and feel as tired and emotional as I was by the time last orders were called. We left the establishment this Christmas Eve around 11pm and our five-minute walk home took the customary 20 minutes, including the obligatory rearrangement of the Santa Stop Here signs outside the neighbours' houses. We then arrived home to find that our dad had been to another establishment that evening and he too had become tired and emotional, but seemingly less emotional and more tired as he was fast asleep in his armchair with singing in the rain blasting out on the television. It was at this point when my brother and I decided that we would follow the beautiful smell that was coming from the kitchen to see exactly what was going on there. Well, Father Simon, it was the most glorious of smells, the waft of freshly cooked turkey that was still warm and crispy and golden and really, quite honestly, just inviting somebody to taste it. Let's just have a small piece each, we said to each other, and promptly delved in to the succulent bird without further ado. Before we knew it, Father Simon, we had eaten three quarters of the turkey. And coming promptly to our senses, and for some reason suddenly sober, we realised that we were going to be really in for it when Mum woke up in the morning. And this is where our master plan, and subsequently my confession, truly begins. I must have been asleep for about an hour before I was woken up by my Mum's hysterical shrieking voice. She'd gone downstairs to wake Dad up and make him go to bed, but was confronted by an unexpected sight. Dad was still asleep in the armchair with a turkey leg in his hand (laughs) and one large but three-quarter eaten turkey on the chair next to him. Yes, my brother and I had planted the evidence and made a fast exit. It was the perfect crime. Dad had drunk so much he couldn't actually remember getting in and although he didn't remember eating the turkey, didn't remember not eating the turkey, so guilty as charged. The grease that we smeared on his lips must also have made it seem a lot more likely that he was indeed the greedy, guilty party. It was at the dinner table the next day, Christmas Day, and the pangs of guilt hit us. Mum had managed to rescue a bit of the turkey, and she shared what was left with me, my brother, my two sisters, and herself, with not a shred of meat for my rotten father. Dad was hanging his head in shame, looking sheepish and repeatedly saying, no, 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 you eat, it's fine. I deserve not to have any for what I've done. I must admit, I wasn't proud of what we had done, but we'd gone too far to back out now. So, Father Simon, I seek forgiveness for this terrible crime of deception, for loading the blame onto my own father, whose only crime was to have a little too much to drink on Christmas Eve, and for ruining the lovely dinner that my mum had worked so hard to prepare. I must let you know, however, that as an act of self-penitence, Every Christmas when Mum has dished out the servings, I take a piece of turkey off my plate and put it onto my dad's plate when no one is looking. But still to this day, my father thinks he is guilty of his midnight Christmas binge. Shocking tale. There are lots of stories which start like that uh, and maybe eat the mince pies and that kind of thing. But no one, as far as I know, 
until Bill and his brother have had the kind of foresight to actually plant all the evidence on uh, Sleepy Father. What do you say, that Sister Rebecca? That is absolutely hilarious. Good it really it. makes me think of the royal family, the TV series. You can imagine the dad exactly sitting in right. the armchair with the turkey. I have to say, it's pretty mean on, on the poor old dad and not really in the festive spirit, though. Um, and it just makes me really sad to think about it. So I'm really he sorry, still, Bill. He still, still thinks it he was still him. He still thinks it was him, exactly. And, I mean, I know the, the, the leg of turkey goes on his plate every year, but that's just not enough. So, Bill, I'm really sorry, but you're not forgiven. Not forgiven. I don't think anyone's going to forgive this one. Well, I think this is one of those stories that... Is going to be told again and again throughout the years um, and be and everyone will laugh about it won't they and I don't so I think it was a great a great idea is the sort of thing that is just funny nobody really got hurt and the only people who did get hurt I think I felt sorry for the mum because she mum was cross yeah she Dad's was really shamed. cross and she she'd done gone to a lot of trouble to get the turkey done and everything but I think it's really funny and they'll get miles and miles of stories out of this for, for years so um so I think I'm going to forgive you brother Matthew I think the, the genius about this is smearing the grease onto the <laughs> onto the lips of the father. That's that's what really turns this one around. You would think I, he was guilty in the fact that he, he didn't know that he wasn't guilty. I love the it? fact that he's no, I was a bit drunk last night and I can't remember not doing this, so he couldn't even fight his own corn. Superb. Uh, what an excellent story. Uh, however, I, I, we do have to point out because I know we'll get emails and I'll get hauled up if I don't say it, but Mo Farah didn't run in the 1500 metres. It was a 5,000 and 10,000 metres. And therefore but, but that doesn't stop it from being a great story and a, com a complete script. It's going to be the best laugh this week. Uh, OK, now uh, we're making an occasional appearance, Brother Nigel. Well, Bill and Ben, they should get Enterprise Grants. That was so clever, and I thought it was really good, and using the, ch the chicken leg as well to plant that on Dad. No wonder he was uh, tired and emotionally. Four children uh, finding solace in alcohol. Uh, but the thing, you see, it was Mum, really, who's made a terrible culinary faux pas. But she's cooked the turkey the night before, which you should never do. Why we not? talked about that recently, because you don't want to be doing that. You want to, you want to cook them quickly but shortly, as short a pace as... Uh, so it's her fault. Really, yes, for going too soon. Wow. Good. She, Mum good peaked spot. too soon on this occasion. So Bill and Ben, uh, <laughs> the brothers, uh, I do. And even Dad, I mean, you know, <laughs> the gluttony, <laughs> unconscious gluttony. Uh, so, yeah, cook it on the morning. Cook it quickly, don't stuff it, and keep it as succulent, keep it breast side down. There you go, Mum. But, N but that's the turkey. Forgiven or not forgiven? Oh, absolutely forgiven. Oh, Hugely. absolutely forgiven. Yes, OK. Yeah. Dear Father Simon and your hopefully forgiving collective, Chances are, Matt will say, forgiven, Bobby will go, mm, I'm all right then. As I am now working as a finance officer for a Church of England diocese in the north of England, I feel that I must hide my true identity to prevent me receiving my P45 with my Christmas card from our bishop. A strong opening, Alice. Yeah. My confession starts in December 1974, when I was a six-year-old little girl living in a small town in South Wales. My two sisters, our brother and I, attended a local Sunday school and our new Sunday school teacher, Blodwin, decided that we should do a nativity play. Has anyone got a doll we could use for baby Jesus? Asked Blodwin. I have, I said, thinking that if they were to use my doll, then I would surely be playing Mary. Obviously. Thank you, Alice, says Blodwin. Right, let's decide who's going to play each part. Now then... Who shall we have to play Mary, said Blodwin, looking straight at me. Yes, I thought, my plan has worked. But as soon as Blodwin said my name, another girl in Sunday school, called Maria, threw herself on the floor and started screaming and crying and generally kicking off and having a tantrum. Clearly assessing the situation, Blodwin then had a quick about turn. On second thoughts, Alice, you'd make a perfect angel and you can sing away in a manger on your own. Maria, if you dry your tears, you can be Mary. Mm. Soft teacher, Blodwin is. Anyway, Blodwin, Blodwin then smiled at me and said, don't be disappointed, there's always next year. Well, I was rather upset, Father Simon, but when I got home and told my mum, she said she'd make me the best angel costume ever and that I could even help her make it if I liked. Fast forward to the night of the nativity, I got dressed in my angel costume, wrapped my doll in one of my little brother's terry nappies, different times. <laughs> it's the nearest we had to swaddling clothes back in mm. the 70s. And put him in my backpack and went off to church. I had to stand behind Mary and Joseph with my arms stretched out for the whole performance, <laughs> waiting for Maria, Mary, to say her one line, which was, baby Jesus is asleep in the manger, while she pulled the blanket off the manger. Now, in our nativity, you see, that was how Mary gave birth to Jesus. Not biologically accurate, but hey, it's Sunday school. What do you yeah, expect? Okay. Then I had to sing the first verse of Away in a Manger all by myself. All in all, for our first attempt at performing a nativity, everything went okay. Each week, 
whilst walking home from Sunday school for the next 11 months, I practised that one line that Mary had to say so that I would be word perfect for our next nativity. Then the Sunday came when Blodwin, still there, said, OK, everyone, we need to talk about the nativity. Good name for a movie. Alice, can we use your doll again as baby Jesus? Yes, Miss Blodwin, of course we can, I replied. Here we go, I'm definitely in now. <laughs> well, said Blodwin, I've been thinking about the nativity. Everyone did so well last year. I've decided that we should all play exactly the same roles what? again this no. year, and I promise we will change next year. I couldn't believe my ears. No I was gutted. But being the true professional that I was, dressed up again in my angel dress, wrapped my doll in my brother's terry nappy, placed him in the manger, and covered him with a blanket ready for Maria, Mary, to give uh, birth to him again. Once again, the nativity went well. I couldn't wait until next year, when at last I would be Mary. Eleven months went past, and again the Sunday arrived, when Blodwin again said, OK, everyone, we need to talk about the nativity. You said that last year, miss. Then she <laughs> continued by saying, this year, I want us to perform a nativity that our audiences will never forget. Very bad idea. Yeah. And tell everyone in town about, so as we've already got our costumes and we know our lines so well, we'll keep the same what? roles. Well, to say I was so. angry would have been an understatement. And I decided that if Blodwin wanted a nativity that everyone would never forget, then yeah. I would certainly make sure that she got her wish. The night of the nativity arrived, and once again I got dressed up in my costume, including the tinsel-wrapped halo, which was by now so tight on my head it felt more like a crown of thorns. When we arrived at church, I once again placed my doll in the manger, ready for his appearance, and stood behind Mary and Joseph, my arms outstretched again, and the biggest smile on my face that I've ever had. The nativity commenced and was going along perfectly until Maria, Mary, pulled off the blanket that covered the baby Jesus. Then, instead of saying her one line, which I knew so well, Maria let out the most terrifying, blood-curdling scream <laughs> of all time. <laughs> See, earlier that night, when I went upstairs to wrap my doll in my brother's Terry Nappy, yeah. I happened to see my mum's red nail varnish, <laughs> and so decided to drench my doll's face to make it look like there was blood pouring out of his eyes, of his nose, his mouth and his ears and neck. Baby Jesus looked like a cross between Chucky and Son of Satan rather than the Son of God, which is what he was supposed to look like. I know this is a shock. Can I just say at that point, if you're feeling shocked, this woman works for the Church of England. Yes. OK, she's a finance officer, so everything is OK. OK? I know that if you're going to complain, complain to her. I know, that, or the Archbishop. I know this was a shocking act, but consider, if you will, that in April of the following year, we moved away to the East Midlands, and I never got the chance to play Mary, and at 49 years old, I don't think I ever will. <laughs> and so I don't seek forgiveness from Maria, because I feel she deserved it, and I certainly do not seek forgiveness from Blodwin. After all, I made her wish come true, a nativity that no one would ever forget. I do, however, seek forgiveness from the following. One, the audience who had to witness a very red-faced, angry Sunday school teacher drag an angel off stage by the scruff of the neck. Two, my poor parents who had to try to tell me off whilst keeping a straight face when all they wanted to do was laugh. Good for them. Three, my lovely two older sisters and our friend Mandy, who after spending hours making their cardboard box camels, never got the chance to trot them down the aisle while singing We Three Kings. And, of course, the baby Jesus who should never really be made to look like a cross between Chucky and the son of Satan. Yeah. Uh, Alice, who works for the Church of England, and so <laughs> therefore it's okay, I think, because finance officers will never do anything wrong. What do you think, Sister Bob B? That's a traumatic childhood. You know, you go to Sunday school and the world is unfair, but you'd expect in Sunday school there would be some fairness, well, you know. Also, I don't think Miss Blodwin was helping very much, no, was no, she? No, I'm saying is I don't know what Miss Blodwin was up to or Blodwin was up to because I think she was very unfair and something was going on because it's not only you that lost out, everyone else. You know, the shepherds wanted to be angels. Do you think everything. money was exchanging hands I'm between saying... Blodwin and... <laughs> And Maria's and mum. Maria's parents. I'm not... I, I have a tenor, Blodwin. All Thank I would you. say Same is, again. Alice, is you're a girl after my own heart in this case. You are absolutely forgiven. Same again, Miss Blodwin. We'll give you a mince pie. Yes, the stench of corruption hangs over think? this particular production, I'm going to say. Um, I, if all nativities like this, I might actually turn up and watch them, because normally they're awful, apart from the bit involving your kid, which is obviously fabulous. Let's and all her. film it together. Yes, let's Stand all up. film it. Let's all... Oh, there they are, being the shepherd. Uh, I don't care.
don't care about the rest because it doesn't involve my child. And, and the great thing is, when you're casting a modern nativity, there's an octopus. Yes, and there's <laughs> and Elvis. And a cowboy. <laughs> and the robots are in now. Uh, well, clearly, Blodwin, because uh, uh, we all know what was going on with Blodwin. Blodwin couldn't cope with Maria throwing the diva uh, crying on the floor. So, she, so basically, Blodwin took the easy way out by saying, we're just going to have the same parts every year. Well, you reap what you sow, Blodwin. You <laughs> reap what you sow. I reckon she got a Christmas box. Absolutely, yes. There's definitely corruption there. Uh, so I'm going to say, uh, forgive me. Father Simon and the amusingly inconsistent collector. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely spotted. A recent three-word texter to the show reminded me of this until now untold confession recounting the consequences of nativity plays, an unforgivable breach of childhood trust, and the actions of a man pushed to and beyond the edge. Those three words for your three-worder were nativity play disaster. And back in 2007, I was already a weary veteran of the primary school nativity play. You know the sort of thing. A hundred small, confused kids milling around in hastily painted cardboard outfits, scenery moving like an early series of crossroads, and sufficient moral messages for even a reasonable man to be surreptitiously reaching for the hip flask. My luck was to be imperfectly placed somewhere close to the front as befitting the husband of a school governor where I could hear desperately excited children belting out classic nativity numbers with little interest in what the actual words might be, or even the tune. Kids of that age can't really carry a tune, but they can certainly take it outside and give it a good kicking. An impression may be forming that the annual pilgrimage to a damp village hall for an hour of forced bonhomie, with absolutely no prospect of a free bar, <laughs> was not my favourite thing, and you'd be right. But at least some of this was instigated by the perennial spectacle of our next-door neighbour's daughter giving it the full Celine, as my wife accurately called it. This precocious child, diva all over the stage all of the time, taking all of the best parts, sometimes at the same time. Some context here. Lovely as our neighbours were, they were the wiki citation of pushy parents. Their two offspring really had to be the best of everything. You may also detect the slightest note of bitterness here as well. Not really, but it did get a bit wearing, especially as the school mafia, and anyone who's been involved with the PTA and governor's so circle of truth will know exactly what I'm talking about, was run with an iron hand by Lottie's mum. And strangely, her daughter would always get the choicest parts with the greatest stage time. Controversial. It is very controversial mm. already. Let me tell you, it's the only nativity play that involved one participant getting about nine costume changes <laughs> and having what? her own changing room. Not our kids, though. They were generally and cruelly typecast with the minor parts. One of those parts being the back end of the Christmas donkey. The other one was generally some some largely forgotten mouse or monkey whose sole role appeared to be falling off the stage. So here we are at Christmas 2007. I arrive, rafishly late, to find Lottie's dad filming the director's cut from a tripod-based camera mounted in the main <laughs> aisle and her mum backstage managing the costume changes and keeping the ugly kids out of shot. I apologised my way <laughs> to a seat next... <laughs> keeping the ugly kids out of shot. Yes. Well done. Well... <laughs> We've all met parents like this. I apologise my way to a seat next to my wife, dumping myself into a too small chair and wondering out loud if anyone knew how the play ended. Sharp and, in <laughs> <laughs> Sharp and entirely deserved digging the ribs from the missus hardly dulled the pain of young Lottie striking a statuesque pose stage front and murdering the opening lines to Away in a Manger. Then I heard a sound, possibly the sound of one of my children falling off the stage, signalling the crux of our little movie. Kings had been heard, wise men followed stars, indoors knocked at, fingers pointing at outside sheds, and a wobbly crib pushed unsteadily onto the stage. On came Lottie, dressed as the kind of angel that may have fallen into a bowl of chocolate, all bright-eyed and significantly trailed. You see, this wasn't the first time I'd been privileged to witness the final scene. Last time round, the neighbours... Last time round the neighbours, Lottie needed almost no encouragement to robustly recite the lines introducing the cribbed child to the masses. She looked thrilled when I complimented her on a perfect performance and she clearly thought of me as a friend, a mistake as it would turn out. So I knew exactly what was coming as she sucked big air into her lungs and with a look of genuine joy, even I had by this time warmed to the whole thing, was especially looking forward to what was coming next, began reciting her lines, Behold! She grabbed swaddling wrapped doll from the grip. Behold the bringer of light, the ruler of the world, God's son on earth, behold! And then nothing. 
just a little kid in the lights with stage fright having oh. forgotten her lines oh, or one line or in this case one word but quite an important one she was one jesus from getting it done but instead just stared at a couple of hundred parents with a frightened o of her mouth she'd forgotten the name of the baby jesus she desperately searched for a friendly face. Mum backstage, probably on the phone to her agent. Dad, <laughs> method acting the cinematographer in the aisle some way back in the dark. She was lost. The silence stretched. The audience waited. And then she finally located that friendly face so desperately needed at this time of crisis. Good old Mark. The very man who complimented her so effusively only a few days ago. She beseeched me with a look of trust and need, and I may have nodded slightly in reply. Reinvigorated now, she backstepped a half line and bellowed, Behold! Then looked at me, confident that I'd give her the word. I gave her a word, all right. I whispered, The Wyan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it Well, was. she didn't whisper it. <laughs> the Wyan! <laughs> rang round the hall like bells ringing out on Christmas Day, as did the laughter echoing back from most of the parents. Her face crumpled. Through confusion to horrors, the laughter rose to a raucous crescendo. Careful use of the word most back there. At least three people didn't seem terribly amused. Two were her parents, now consoling her with heartfelt messages of support and sticky chocolate, and my wife, who I dared not look at. But I knew she was looking at me. I do have a bit of a history of looking for a cheap laugh without considering the consequences, so it was pretty much the prime suspect, even if she hadn't actually witnessed my misdemeanour. Obviously, I admitted nothing. I have absolutely no idea why Laura didn't grasp me up, but she never did. So I don't ask forgiveness of the parents, who frankly learned an important lesson about the line between pushiness and pretension, nor from the other kids, who for weeks afterwards would run around the playground reenacting the final scene and screeching, BWIAN! <laughs> or from my wife, to whom I've had to apologise so so many times for my inappropriate behaviour, a public apology would offer nothing new. But I obviously have to ask forgiveness from Lottie, who deserves something better in her time of great need than a man looking for a cheap laugh and some natural justice. I can only hope the next man she chooses is far more trustworthy and morally upstanding than me. Uh, well, it's an, uh, you don't want to have someone like Mark to trust on. You're looking out there, that's, you want someone just to tell you the word that you're looking for, and it's not Brian. <laughs> it that is a brilliant Jesus. confession. Mm. That was one of the funniest ones we've ever had. Beautifully written, just hysterical. I took out about Beautifully seven, read, of course. I, yes, thank Beautifully you. read I, as I did, well. I took out about seven pages, <laughs> I have to tell you. The thing is, I mean, Mark, I think he's telling himself it was meant to be a joke, but actually, what was he motivated by? Jealousy. Yes. And it's not a very pretty trait, revenge. is it? And revenge. And he's an adult, Lottie's a child. I mean, OK, Lottie's chosen for all the best parts, but it's not her fault, it's her parents' fault for being very pushy. So I think... Yeah, wrong target, wasn't it? Wrong, wrong target, target. Yeah. exactly. So I think Lottie suffered needlessly. And I'm not forgetting... You. OK, I think that's an interesting answer. Let's see what Novice Nigel makes of that. Well, gosh, I've been vacillating there. Um, but I think that in 25 years she'll have a comeback uh, and do that very scene again and will do brilliantly as well. And there is an old adage that you must die quite a few times on stage to succeed as an actor. Uh, and on that basis... You say that as if you know. Uh, well... <laughs> it is, but having said that... It's a bit rum to forget the name of Jesus in the nativity play, isn't it? Has it she was nervous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mean it doesn't change every year? OK, right. so... <laughs> Jesus, Jesus... Anyway, <laughs> uh, so on that basis, um, I think, Mark, you're not forgiven because oh, okay. you are nasty. Yes, well, uh, Brother Matthew. Do you know why this is such a great confession? Apart from the fact that I absolutely identify with, with Mark and his feelings on being at these plays, is that we're not laughing at, at, at Lottie stroke Laura stroke whatever. Um, we're not laughing at the girl because we're laughing with her because actually she got a great response from the crowd and they all loved it and they're going to talk about that performance for years to come and she's going to bask in that so um i i know really the person that we should be uh directing our ire at is those parents uh, who needs costume changes in the nativity they're all wearing the same thing how i've never heard of a nativity where people have to change costumes halfway through nine costumes you know, absolute disgrace Swap so um for, for that obviously we're going to forgive uh, but it is a blood Dear Most Honourable Sir Simon of the Clergy, your fellow clergymen, clergy women, clergy dogs and cats, in fact, any clergy person who may aid in my possible acquittal. That's everyone covered. Okay. <clears throat> I yeah. think so. It's a little bit desperate, Marie, but anyway, never mind. <laughs> my confession dates to the year of 1987, when I was 19 and naughty and blissfully disconnected from the concept of consequences. 
Before I continue, I must state in my one and only defence that this incident was not planned, as I've just mentioned, not premeditated. It was not considered. It really did happen in a moment of nonchalant reaction, which retrospectively may have changed the course of history. And for this, I wholeheartedly and absolutely and abjectly apologise. Big build up to this. I know. I don't want to. I don't want to disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Marie says I've always been known to play the clown, and I'm often responsible for either reducing friends and family to fits of giggles, or indeed giggling myself at inappropriate times when not giggling would have been a more suitable option. I guess the word mischievous fits me very well. I don't think that's played very well, by the way, Marie. Okay. Story begins with myself and my friend heading on foot into town early one evening to partake in probable beverage-enhanced frivolity. As you'll recall, there were no mobile phones in 1987. Instead, those good old, rather unpleasant-smelling red telephone boxes were generally positioned quite readily on many a street corner. Sometimes, as you may have experienced firsthand, they would ring. And on this occasion, the one that we were passing was indeed ringing. The loud echoing... <laughs> Remember that sound? Remember oh. what a phone sounds like? Made me stop in my tracks. Now, what I should have done was the normal, sensible action of pulling open the heavy, squeaking door and simply picking up the telephone to inform the unsuspecting person it's enough of that on the other end that they had misdialed to a public phone box and not a private number as they undoubtedly thought mm -hmm. that they had rung that's what they intended however that's what I should have done what happened was the exact opposite hello I spoke into the mouthpiece of the black heavy cold instrument it makes it sound like a weapon mm -hmm. phone this was followed by a short pause and then who are you? said a rather irritated, and if I may say slightly possessive sounding female voice. I don't know how you do possessive. Who are you? How's that? That's mm. okay, it's pretty good. Well, who are you? I responded, maybe in a slightly menacing tone, oh, but impromptu nonetheless. Well, where's Mike? came back at me down the phone. Oh, dear. Again, if I may say so, with a rather unnecessary angry nature. Thinking on my feet, I then uttered the three words I've regretted ever since. Oh, dear. He's in bed. Oh, no. Another short silence. He's what? He's in bed, I repeated. The voice down the phone. Well, you'd better not be in bed with him. <gasps> okay. Well, I'm not anymore, I said. Oh. I am on my way over! <gasps> Came bellowing down the earpiece followed by the clicking noise and a dead tone that indicated I'd just been disconnected. I think she hung up on me, I said. I remember thinking that as we continued our jaunt into town, that every car passing us could contain Mike's seething, raging girlfriend or fiancé or whoever on her way to confront him. And over the years, over the many, many years since then, I still wonder what became of Mike and his rather uppity girlfriend. And I... Clearly, what I might have said might have led to a few uncomfortable you moments. You think? So I kind of need mercy and forgiveness, but not from Mike's girlfriend, but from Mike himself, who was probably just eating his dinner on a tray, on his lap, watching the A-team or something the way we did back then, and oblivious to why his now very enraged better half was about to burst into his home like a woman possessed and ransack his bedroom, screeching, Where is she? My only consolation to this day is that had Mike actually been a naughty boy, I might have done somebody somewhere a favour, but maybe I'm being slight, slightly desperate there. I think, Marie, you almost certainly are, but it's thinking on her feet. She says, where's Mike? She says he's in bed. Not with me. Not anymore. Thank you very much indeed. Let's see what Sister Bobby makes of that. Mm, it's, it's difficult, because I understand if you're a mischievous type and, uh, you know, lots of things are funny. However, you were 19 and adult yeah you are an adult and you kind of are aware because when she said when you said oh he's in bed because you thought that might be mischievous and she said 
I hope not still with you. That would have been your time actually to go, OK, the mischievousness has now gone too far. I need to come straight with this. I need to be straight. You could have saved that at any point. I understand maybe first two steps, the first two dalliances down the funny road, but you should have got out of this. So, Marie, I'm going to tell you, you are not acquitted. Not acquitted. Not forgiven. <clears throat> Harsh, uh, but maybe fair, well, Brother Matthew. I, th I think <clears throat> very fair, because, uh, I mean, yes, I agree. There were, there were a number of points in this conversation where you could have steered it away and go, ha, ah, actually, I've just, you've just dialed a random phone box and I just picked up the phone, and uh, isn't this very, uh, very amusing? Uh, however, you went along with it, and you went along with it until she puts down the phone. So she obviously is thinking there's some strange woman in her uh, boyfriend's flat. So uh, I am not going to forgive. And I, I admit, if that means that I no longer have the morals of a sewer rat, then so, then so be it, uh, because uh, someone has to is take a not, stand. <clears throat> is it not the uh, woman on the other end of the phone, the, the uppity girlfriend? Is well, it not her uh, fault? Well, here's no. the other thing. How, how does she get called uppity? Just because she dials a number thinking it's the right number, and some strange woman answers at her boyfriend's place. Uh, I think she's well within her rights to be... Um, uppity and possessive, the, says No, Marie. no, uh, I don't think she's being uppity at all. I think she's being well within her rights to, to have a have a go. Okay. How can she be possessive, Marie, yes. if she is the girlfriend and you've alluded to another woman? Yeah. So that's not yeah. possessiveness. Like that. so yeah, very much backing me up there, Bobby. Well yeah. done.